Right. Well, I think I get that just after sort of half past. So um, we'll kick things off. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Roston Spring webinar. We would normally obviously look to do this um, with, with seminars uh, at Nantwich Football Club um, or at Rhys Heath. But unfortunately, given these circumstances, we're, we're unable to do that. Um, but we're quite conscious of the updates and what's around the table with the agricultural transition period and other subsidy. So hence, hence we're doing um, this this evening. So there's three of us on the call from Rostons. Um, Tony Rimmer, that most of you will know, my colleague Georgina Simmons. So um, just a bit of housekeeping, as I've mentioned, um, we will be recording this evening. So if you do want to catch up on it, um, then there will be opportunity to do that. As I've mentioned, if we could please mute, obviously we won't mute ourselves, um, but if you could please mute yourselves during this, um, there is an opportunity to have some questions at the end in the chat box. So if you could put that in there, I'll pick them up at the end. And if you wanna have a question, a question the speaker after they've given your answer, then obviously take yourself off mute um, for that one. Um, now, as I mentioned, agenda wise, there's two speakers, which will be Tony and George. Tony will be giving a, Bit of an update of the agricultural transition period bps um, and the future of that and then my colleague georgina will be then finishing off with the countryside stewardship scheme and elms and then hopefully we'll we'll have a few questions so i will pass you over to tony next who will just give you a little bit of a summary of rostons of where we're up to uh, and what we're doing um, and we should go from there so hopefully that's all right any questions pop in the chat box thanks very much Good evening, ladies and gents. Um, sorry, we're not seeing you in the flesh, so to speak, but I think we're all getting very used to this way of dealing with things um, over the last 12 months. Um, I'm not going to say much about Rostons. Hopefully, you, by coming on, you know who we are. We've got a fantastic team. Um, we managed to get them all with smiley faces um, sometime in recent months, years. Can't have been too recent because we're not social distanced. Um, but uh, we've got a fantastic team. We've been operating, um, trying to keep business as usual for the last um, 12 months since COVID hit. Um, we've broken into two teams last summer. We actually took a secondary small office um, so that the two teams could um, stay on, uh, keep working so that should we have a scare, we uh, could still keep operating and it's worked very well. Um, at the moment, um, those that cannot work adequately from home are in the office and um, certainly our graduates are in the office because we need to get them trained right and uh, we're conscious that uh, that contact is needed to make sure everybody can continue to deliver our service. So that's enough about what we are and who we are. Um, and technology should advance my slide to what you've um, all wished to talk about or learn about, which is the agricultural transition period. Some of you will remember way back prior to Christmas, 18th of December, um, the agricultural transition period was published. It covers the period 2021 to 2027, and that applies in England. Wales have published a brief version of their own, and there are more policies emerging from Wales. What you've got to remember now is it is back to made in Britain or made in England, the policy on um, agriculture and support. So what we're probably likely to see over the next uh, six years is a generation's change. Um, well, I put here in the next decade. So over the next 10 years, I think we are going to see a lot of change over this period. So what does it all mean? And, you know, there is a big document there with a lot in. Um, some of you will have heard a number of these phrases and perhaps wonder what they mean um, and how it's going to affect you. I mean, what they've made quite clear is DEFRA will support farmers and land managers, but the emphasis of that support is changing to improve the environment, improve animal and health and welfare, reduce carbon em emissions and store more carbon, support resilience of agriculture and ecosystems to climate change and make 
businesses more sustainable. And I think the big thing that we all need to pick up on is we all concentrate on the agricultural tran transition bill, um, but there is equally the environmental legislation. And that is what is going to keep um, or going to suddenly catch up with us, I think. Um, so just finishing off the previous slide, um, changes to support will be made from 2021 to 2027. You know, they're talking about less top-down rule setting, removal of needless bu bureaucracy, and removal of that strict enforcement where common sense wasn't applying. And certainly having had um, a speaker from quite high up in RPA today um, on a meeting, they are looking to do that. Um, in their whole design of these new schemes, they're looking to be more collaborative. They want to see useful change and genuine support for farmers. So that's all encouraging. So what are the headline things? We, we know that the current government have said that the agricultural support through to 2024, that pot of money is safe. That will not go anywhere. But what they have said is they are going to phase your basic payment scheme payments down. And they're going to do it very much on a banding, like the way um, income tax works. So we've got various bandings, as you can see on the slide, payments up to 30,000 reduced in year one by 5%, um, year two, 20%, year three, 35%, and year four, 2024, 50%. You can see the rates for the higher payments. And if you look, if for those that are on a, a band of more than 150,000, which I don't think there's many of you, and certainly I'm not going to ask any of you to put your hand up if you are in that bracket, um, you can see that by 2024, the reduction is over 70%. So quite a telling change in support over um, that four-year period. So, you know, the key headline for most of you, by 2024, your subsidy is going to be reduced by 50%. So just looking what that means on the value of your payments, you know, for those of you that get in the region of 20,000, which is probably an average Cheshire one, that sort of region, you know, 2021, 19,000, 2022 reduced to 16, 2023, 13,000, 2024, um, 10,000. So you can see on this slide here, the way it drops. And you'll have heard talk of delinking. And many people are asking about the delinking and the lump sum packages that have been talked about in this um, agricultural transition uh, bill. So delinking effectively removes your need to have land and the need to farm land to get payments. So what does that effectively mean? So in 2024, they are saying that they're going to remove that link and come up with a different proposition. As yet, we don't know what that is. There is going to be consultation later this year. But if you go back to what I said earlier, the current pot of money is only guaranteed for the life of parliament. This parliament is guaranteed they look to have a majority. They should stay there until 2024. So what happens after then is all fair game. That's why there is no prediction um, and no phasing beyond 2024. So what of this retirement package or lump sum payment? It is an option from 2022. No rules are known yet. So this is my best guess. It, it opens for you to take a lump sum in 2022. If it follows previous schemes, some of you will remember the reference years for, BP, well, for what was then single payment in 2000, what came in in 2005. It was a reference year previous years. So I think they are likely to adopt a reference year of either 2020 or 2021. So if you claimed in 2020 or 2021, you are likely to be eligible to take the retirement package or lump sum. 
I think it is likely to be badged more at retirement. So they're looking that it is people getting out of the industry. It will probably be capped because they've only got a finite pot. This is money that you would receive in the normal course of events between 2021 and 2027. So a lot of people are saying to me, well, how much is that going to be? I think you're fairly safe if you look at a multiplier of your 2021 payment and it being two or three times that but that is very much a prediction that is not set in stone we have no guidance on it none whatsoever but that is probably going to be a conservative sort of payment the next question is how is that going to be taxed it could come as capital gains tax. It could come as um, retirement type reliefs. You could be eligible for, and there could be an age limit on who can take that sum. So it's one of the things that a lot of people are asking about. If you look at the TFA survey recently, they said something like 60% of their members are likely to be interested in this. So it's something that people are talking about, but we haven't got the information yet. So just you know, have regard to that. Now, that is all we can really say about what is happening with the current BPS scheme. Now, what, you, what you've seen from what I've said is that income is going to become reduced. And it is how you deal with that reduced income between 2021 and 2024, and then going forward, that is going to be important. You will have heard lots of talk of ELMS and other schemes coming in, and we'll touch on those later. But as is often the way with Rostons, what we want to tell you is what we know and what the facts are and what you can do to help your farming businesses now. And countryside stewardship, which is something that has probably put off a lot of people in recent years, could be a gap to fill it. Equally, they have brought in a lot of new elements to it that could make it attractive to you. Now, Georgina Simmons in our team did a lot of countryside stewardship applications last year. She is doing them this year. So I'm going to hand you over to Georgina, who will cover off countryside stewardship, and then I'll catch up with you a bit later. Georgina. Don't, don't, don't. There we go, George, you should have control now. You're just on mute. Don't. If anyone else um, isn't, who isn't presenting, wouldn't mind putting themselves on mute as well as there's been a bit of background um, noise coming through. Can you hear me now? Sorry. There we go. Okay, lovely. I just can't. Sorry, I can't see the um, the the um slideshow at the moment. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Sorry about this, ladies and gents. Oh, okay. <laughs> the computer's playing up. Uh, um technology always tests all of us all i'm relieved about is me as the older one managed to work technology which is a surprise um, what i will do george is put the slides the, up. yeah could you put it back to the beginning because i can't i can't seem to control it sorry about this there you go george you see that yeah thank you Got it. Okay. Lovely. Sorry, can you skip to the next one? I can't seem to do anything. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tap. You give okay. me the nod. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, as Tony said, um, last year was my first year of submitting um, Countryside Stewardship. Um, so this will be my second. 
um, and we thought it was important for me to come on and talk about it um, as a result of the transition plan which was published in November sort of highlighted as you had explained to you the reductions in BPS and maybe how a stewardship agreement um, will set you up basically for ELMS but may bridge the gap between the reduction um, in BPS and receiving an income under stewardship. Um, so stewardship is split into three sort of categories, um, this being a mid-tier application, um, wildlife offers and new for 2021 um, capital grants. Um, so mid-tier, there are hundreds of options <laughs> that you can apply for under a mid-tier application, but I thought I might highlight some of the, the more popular ones that we've um, experienced. Um, so you can see on the screen, um, AB9, AB12, SW1, SW2 and GS4. Um, I think most of them are arable options. Um, options do seem to favour more arable um, land type, um, but there are some for grassland um, as well. Um, in terms of capital items, again, there are a lot um, and it's capped at 150, which is still you know, quite a huge sum of money. Um, the popular ones that we've experienced um, being fencing, um, installing new livestock troughs, concrete, yard renewal, roofing um, of slurry stores um, and floating covers for, for slurry stores as well. So that's just a brief overview of what you may be able to achieve under a mid-tier application. Um, and I would just point out that mid-tier is competitive, um, but we haven't had a, you know, an agreement rejected. I think they're pretty pretty fairly open to mid-tier applications. So although it is competitive, most um, all of them have been successful. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, then we move on to the wildlife offers. So wildlife offers um, aren't competitive. And if you can meet um, the set criteria of them, then you're essentially guaranteed um, an agreement. Um, so lowland grazing office offers um, are based, at, based on obviously lowland grazing farms, um, mainly low input farms. So we found that, um, you know, if you're farming sheep or you don't use a lot of fertilizer for whatever reason, this may be a good one for you. Um, arable offers, um, obviously for arable farms, there are a lot more um, options under this one. Um, and that's been a popular one as well. And then the mixed farming, which I think probably might apply to more Cheshire farmers, obviously a mixture of everything has also been a popular one as well. So new for this year, which I think will be very popular um, with our clients is the new capital grant. So there's 67 options in total under this grant, split into three categories, as you can see. So boundaries, water and air with 20,000 pounds per category. So totaling 60,000. And I have listed on here some of the ones we think might be popular, but as I said, there are 67. Um, so it's worth giving us a call or doing a bit of research on Google as to, as to some that may be applicable to you. Um, in terms of the water and the air quality, in order to apply, you have to be in a high water priority area, um, which I will explain on the next slide. So here you can see, it's not very clear, but a map of the sort of area that we work in. So the red areas being the high water priority area and the yellow still a priority, but not as high. So in order to get, you know, those um, capital grants under air and water, concrete renewal, that sort of thing, you need to be in the red. And you can check this on a website called Magic, or you can ring the office and any of us should be able to check fairly quickly for you what area you fall into. So these are the key dates for this year. And I think the most important two, um, on the 30th of April, which is the deadline to submit a capital grant, and the six weeks before submitting your application, you need consent from your catchment sen sensitive farming officer. For most of those capital items that I've listed, you will need consent. So that means you have to have your written consent by the 18th of March, which I think is three weeks tomorrow. <laughs> so definitely something, if you are interested, please do give me a call and, you know, we can get on with it. Um, 
In terms of a mid-tier and a wildlife offer, they close at the end of July. But again, under a mid-tier, if you're looking um, for capital items which require consent, which a lot do, um, you need that approval six weeks prior as well. Thank you. I think we're over to you, Tony, now, aren't we? You've muted yourself. The classic. Well, the classic. Someone's got Had to do it, haven't they? To give you all a bit of a smile. You know, we <laughs> always like to have a bit of amusement and uh, it's never as easy when you can't see the audience. Um, I think I am now on environmental land management, ELMS. This is the scheme that everybody is trailing that's going to come in and we don't know too much detail. We know there are going to be pilot schemes later this year and by mid-April, we will have more details on to how the pilot schemes are working and who can apply for those pilot schemes. But the general rule within ELMS is what they're looking at is clean and plentiful water, clean air, protection from and mitigation of environmental hazards, mitigation of and adaption to climate change, thriving plants and wildlife, beauty, heritage and engagement. So nothing about increasing your productivity or helping you to, be, to farm. But if we go back to the basic premise of what all the new regime on support is, it is public money for public good. And equally sat alongside this is the environmental legislation. And um, there are some major targets on that environmental side. So with every ELMS application, you are going to have to do a land management plan for your holding. That will cover what features you have, a bit like the old plans that we did way back when in the um, stewardship um, and the entry level stewardship when that first came in with the basic tiers. And it's very much, someone summed it up um, the other day, the government will only pay something for a something policy, i.e. where that is giving them some benefit, where they can show that it's helping making clean air, it's keeping water supplies protected, it's wildlife, it's beauty, it's all those sort of elements looking at the countryside. And I don't think particularly in Cheshire where people are wanting to farm intensively for dairying um, or intensive stock where they want to use a grazing system that grazes every inch of the holding, it is going to be too suited for them. And you might be looking that your subsidy money is going to come from some of the capital um, schemes that we'll come on to in a minute. But as I say, at the moment, we haven't got the rules. There's going to be three levels. The sustainable farming incentive, which everybody is trailing as the light touch, simple, um, basic scheme, similar to probably the entry level stewardship. There will be some achieving of environmental outcomes, a foundation. So putting in buffer strips, hedges being cut every other year, that sort of thing is where that is looking at. But for the levels of payment that you're likely to get, I think a number of you that are farming um, to maximize your output and on a commodity type um, production system, you will steer clear of that because you won't want the restrictions. We then have a local nature recovery level. Once again, that's locally targeted. It encourages farmers getting together to create wildlife corridors, to look at a whole area scheme. So you can see it happening more um, where we're on more marginal land or where we're down on the mosses, areas like that where they can do more. You can see that sort of level coming in. And then finally, you've got the landscape recovery, which is going to be on a big scale basis across large areas. And it's going to lead to major change um, and long term changes in land use. That's the way it's looking at the moment. As I say, I think for Cheshire, I think farmers will make a choice when the rules come out on this, that they're either in it for producing a commodity 
as cheaply as possible, maximizing production and wanting to manage and use every inch of their land, depending on their holding, you know, depending what their cropping is. Then for some, if they're more mixed cropping and perhaps they've got areas against woodlands or flood meadow or land of that nature, then they might start to look at it because they can get into the local nature recovery level, the level two tier, as it's been called, and then start to look at it. That's where I think it's going to start heading. But time will tell. You know, we don't know the rules. We'll know more. As I say, as the year goes on and rest assured when we've got something of substance to tell you on this we'll make sure we get it out to you in whatever way so there's various other pots of money that are going to come on come on stream through 2021 2022 and through to 2024 as they take the money away from um the bps to put it into um, the other pots that they can then take it and give it out for different things. So the first one that I think is going to become very relevant, and I would suggest all of you should be keeping an eye out for this, is the Farming Investment Fund. That's going to be a range of grants and investments aimed at increasing productivity, increasing resilience, increasing skills through training and technology. It's going to be part match funded by the farmer landowner. So you're not going to get all your money, but you'll get funding towards it. And probably the more public good that can be perceived by the item that is being funded, the higher the amount of funding that it will create. You know, there's likely to be farming equipment, technical funds, the smaller grants, probably similar to the countryside productivity grant scheme that a number of you will have used in the last 12 months, two years to fund small items of capital on the holding and then larger um, grants for major farming transformation, technology, infrastructure changes. So I think that that is one to really keep an eye on. Um, you know, a lot of our clients had a good success with the Countryside Productivity Grant Scheme, getting funding there um, for all sorts of things. So, you know, keep your eyes open on it. By all means, ring us on anything. There's talk of a new entry support scheme, helping the new entrant. Now, if it follows the lines of previous new entry, entry schemes, it's going to be available to new entrants. I think that might be more limited. I think it could, as we've seen changes with the availability of starter farms and the council selling off their farms, I could see some of that funding being moved into supporting council farms, setting up smaller farms to help um, someone start off. There could be other forms of support in training. Um, it's going to open for applications in 2022, but we're not really clear where it's going to be. It's going to help some. Um, obviously, many of you will have been aware of the rules for new entrants in the past. You've got that the new entrant has to have over 50% of control of the business. So once again, it depends whether it's elig you're eligible for it. It depends whether you can make your business suited to get that funding. So once again, watch the space if you're, you're, you're young. Um, it may be for you. Slurry investment scheme. I really do think as a industry, as a, an area we're placed in Cheshire with so much livestock, we really need to be aware of the issues that are coming down the line with air and water quality, with the environmental plan, with the net zero emissions and all that side. So once again, I would suggest you start having regard to where your business is going with slurry storage. You know, there are going to be raised standards of slurry storage introduced, um, probably likely to be a minimum of six months storage required, which will hit a lot of businesses. We've seen Wales in the last, 12, last month or so come out and say um, that all their NVZ areas or the whole area will have to have five months storage. So 
under the slurry investment scheme, which is going to be introduced in 2022 to help farmers, there will be capital payments to reduce pollution by investment in stores, making sure stores are up to standard, future proofing your business in line with these higher standards, clean air strategy. So what are the likely capital costs that they'll pay for? Building of new stores, covers, associated equipment, um, but not your maintenance or your planning costs, not keeping what you've got, but improving things because then they can argue it's public good because they are taking ammonia out of the atmosphere. And that is going to be a big way things are going to head. Um, if you look at the countryside stewardship and those capital grants um, option there, you've heard it from George. Um, that is where the catchment farming sensitive officers come in. They, you can get the payments to do a number of works there. Um, you know, looking at how ammonia is reduced, because I think something like 80% comes out of cubicle sheds um, and from the livestock industry, intensive livestock industry. So that is going to be something that uh, you need to be aware of. The farming in productive landscapes, probably unlikely to affect much of you, many of you um, that are in Cheshire. For those of you that are on um, the borders or um, up into the Peak District and the national parks, um, you will see payments there. It's protecting landscape, it's, it's assistance with carbon capture, so managing perhaps the um, moorland and everything up there better, um, carbon capture, dry stone wall repairs, something similar to what you've seen under higher level stewardship, but mainly aimed at those um, landscapes um, and protecting those landscapes. Farm resilience. Um, this it's going to be available in the first three years of the transition. Um, so, you know, there's a hint for you. It's transition. It's helping you make your business um, resilient to cope with these changes of the move of subsidies and the reduction in subsidies. And it's targeting those individuals and businesses most likely to be affected by removal of the direct payments. So, um, you know, Another thing to be aware of, the innovation, development and research schemes. For those of you that are budding entrepreneurs, want to look at um, different things, this will fund cooperation between farmers, agribusinesses and researchers to undertake research and development project over the course of three years. So, you know, once again, it's looking at ways to increase productivity, to look at ways of doing things differently. Um, so just keep an eye out. Um, for those animal health and welfare grants they'll be small one-off grants invest and improve welfare above the statutory baseline um, those sort of grants they're likely to have vets input um, I think we'll see you know grants that help that animal welfare skills and training we know as an industry skills and training has lacked in the past you know they're looking to establish a hub for training and develop skills in agriculture you know it all sounds very good in practice we haven't got the rules we haven't got um the detail yet of what it all means but i think we've started to get a feel as to what's coming down the line and what you need to do um, with your businesses to prepare because the fundamental take-home message for you all is when you look at last year's profit and loss account and you look at that bottom line how much of that is made up by your current basic payment and I would suggest without wishing to depress you all you have a look at that because if that subsidy is going to be cut by 50 percent what is it going to do with your profitability? But then the positive to look at is that if you then analyze your accounts further, 85% of your income comes from trade, only 15% from subsidy. So if you get a 10% change in that product price, which isn't a huge amount, you know, on a ton of wheat, at 150, it's an extra 15 pound a ton. 
that equates to a 50% moving subsidy. So if we can get the income up with your commodity prices, it will soon offset that drop in subsidy. But that is outside your control because you've got a milk contract. Yes, you know what you're going to be paid, but you don't set that milk price or you don't set that price for your beef. You know what you're going to get when you go into ABP or if you go in the market, you've got that choice as to whether you sell it or not. But that's outside your control. What you can control is what you do in your business. Because whilst, you know, I go back to when I came into this profession far too many years ago, um, you know, farming was a lot more a way of life then. We have seen substantial change if I look back, even to when I came into Cheshire 25 years ago. You know, the difference, if we really think back and the changes we've seen have been substantial. So I think what you all need to look at is what in my business does pay? What does not? What am I doing because I like to do it and I know it doesn't contribute to my bottom line? And actually, what am I doing that does pay the bills? And is it really what I want to do? And where is this farming business going to be in 10 years time? Because in another five to 10 years time, there will only be the different forms of support that we've just talked about. That basic payment that came in whatever, just by holding the land is unlikely to exist. They've said at the moment, it won't exist. So where is that going to leave you? Is any reinvestment sensible? Is it right? Where do you want to be? I've probably gone on enough about the environment, the ammonia, the air, the water quality, that you'll all be bored of it. But I really do think that is the concern that I see for the dairy industry. And I suppose the more and more I hear of this from the uh, policy makers, the more that element is worrying me because that is a major cost to cover slurry lagoons, to change systems instead of using splash plates, to use um, dribble bars, to use... Yes, a lot of people are doing it already, but there's an awful lot that still isn't. And I think as well, and we, we've, we see it all too often, that the next generation sort of drifts into the farming business, not because it's what they want to do, because it's what they have a desire for. Don't get me wrong, the farm gives them a fantastic base and you never know what you've lost until you've given it up. And I think, you know, many people think of farming as the hard life, but actually probably if you look back on the positives, family have been brought up in a very nice environment and you've had a good way of being your own boss. So it's what you want because if you're passionate and you want to do it and you've got the drive, you will do it. It's when you're doing something that you're just doing for the sake of it. So I think some hard soul searching in some pl places are needed. And there are opportunities. You know, there are other things you can do with that asset base. There are other things that you can do with the skills you've got. But it's just being open to it. And it's starting to plan as to how you are going to adjust your business with all these changes if you need to. I'm sure many of you or a number of you don't need to adjust because you'll be fine because you've already done those adjustments. But for the rest, it's just looking at it. You know, take a step back, ask those soul searching questions and above all, then speak to people that can assist you and people that you know and trust, whether that's your accountant, your bank manager, your solicitor, your land agent, whoever, your consultant, whoever it is. Because sometimes we all are too insular in what we think. We don't see the wood from the trees because all we know is what we know. So just sometimes take that step back and have a review um, because there are no end of opportunities out there.
So I think at this stage we've we've gone on for best part of um, forty minutes, um, forty five minutes. Um, I don't know whether any questions have gone into the the chat box or whether we've just bored all all of you senseless. The few people I can see on camera, I'm pleased to say, have stayed awake. So I'm quite chuffed with that. I've been I've been sent some direct ones, Tony. So you'll be glad to hear there are some questions. <laughs> um, so you're more than welcome to um, send them to me privately if people would like to. So I've got one. Um, previously, um, BPS penalties have been used as a threat or blackmail tool from DEFRA in the past. What do you think will, will be replaced with this in the future? Oh, I like simple ones like that. Thank you. Legislation. What's It'll be legislation on pollution, air control, that side of things that will be the stick that they'll beat you with. Okay, another question, same same person. Are there any ideas on future grants for diversification like leader funding that was previously? There has been talk that there will be large capital grant, grant schemes. Um, we haven't got much detail on it. Equally, you know, we're seeing all business sectors challenged at the moment. I think there will become a lot more grants out there for businesses in the wider sector, um, which may well be be run by um, the local enterprise partnership, LEP funding, that sort of thing that's been going on in the past um, in some format, and there could be the ability to access some of those. Okay. And what do you think the future of rents and the value of land would be? Well, do with you... payments being dink linked. Shall I answer that with what I think should happen or what we're seeing happening in the marketplace at the moment? Give us, give us both. Because <laughs> if, 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 if one thinks that the subsidy has always been going to the farmer um, and we have been factoring that into what we pay for rent, the logic says that rent should go down. And that's what I say is the logic. But what we've seen in recent months is that actually the demand for land is very strong. And for those that ever studied even basic economics, the supply and demand curve is what sets a market price. And there's been limited supply and demand has been strong. So we have seen land without subsidy um, making between 160 and 200 pounds for maize on a sing seasonal basis for grassland um, to um, mow silage, do whatever um, in the region of 120 to 150 and blocks of land where it's being let on two three-year tenancies um, in the region of 180 to 200 and those are all fresh lettings in the last two months so probably not the answer the person who um, wrote the question wanted but I'm afraid as we said land is a finite resource I think if land is close to a farming business that is expanding it is worth a premium to them. There are a lot of farmers that are spending an awful lot of time sat on a tractor or uh, tractors going all around the county pulling produce in. And if they can get it closer to home, it has got to be worth a premium to them. Okay. The questions are starting to fly in now through the private inbox. Um, <laughs> it's gone from nothing from all at once. So, um, George, one here is... How long are countryside stewardships for and what happens if they want to go into elms? Um, so a mid-tier agreement or wildlife offer um, is five years and a standalone capital is two years. Um, in terms of elms, um, the government have said you would essentially be able to leave your stewardship agreement um, and move into elms. You wouldn't face any penalties. Okay. Tony, a cross-border farmer, do we know how Wales will phase out the single payment, single farm payment? Well, I'm delighted to tell the, the individual. He is no longer a cross-border farmer because this year we have to make an application 
as we've done in previous years, to Wales and to England, but they will be separate applications. So you're not, you are just dealing with each individual paying authority on each area. As to how Wales is phasing out, we're still waiting some more information on that. And um, we did badge this as being mainly England, um, and we will be putting a Welsh um, one on. And I know you will be on our mailing list to let you know when we are doing a Welsh seminar, because um, I saw the name pop up. So I know we, you definitely um, will be getting an invite. Okay. One's going back to the slurry store. My biggest concern is a slurry store cover. Lagoons were not designed for covers. What are these covers needed to do? Just keep rainwater out or emissions in. Emissions, emissions in, but it will undoubtedly reduce rainwater um, going in. I mean, I am no expert on covers. All I know is what they are talking about. It's worth, I think it's 2027 they're going to um, insist that all slurry lagoons or towers have to be covered. So there's this funding available at the moment. There's no guarantee that's going to be available in the future with the countryside stewardship. So I'm not sure how much a cover costs, but if there's funding there, it might be worth looking into. Um, another countryside stewardship. I have a countryside stewardship agreement already running with sorry, uh, running, uh, but have capital items which isn't covered by this agreement, do I have to wait until I start a new one before I can claim funding? Um, so in terms of being in an existing either ELS, which was the old scheme, or stewardship now, um, land or areas that aren't under your existing agreement can go into a new one. Um, but if you're wanting to claim one areas that are already in an agreement, um, you will have to have to wait, yeah. Okay. And one on the retirement lump sum. Do you think to receive the retirement lump sum, you'll have to be you'll be locked out in effect of any other future grants or subsidies? Yes, I do. I think it, it, it's effectively paying your money up front um, to get out, and uh, you'll be um, out of it on that basis. Okay. And Tony, got one last one. What do you think the value of entitlements is going to do over the next couple of years? I mean, we've seen trade for this year remain pretty similar to what um, it was doing last year as the opening trade around 120 to 150 pound a hectare. Um, I mean, entitlements have always been about one year's payment, the, the capital value, um, which has made them a good investment. I think they'll naturally scale down as the as the payments decrease. Um, I think a lot would depend on what rules come out on the, the reference year. Um, you know, we've seen all sorts of... Um, trying to think of the right word manipulations is probably wrong but um things being done to increase payment pots you know whether it was uh, in the dim and distant days of um milk quota and historical payments being transferred to um scotland um because they were on a historical basis we'll we'll see somebody try and capitalize and i think the the values will stay pretty similar to what they are now one times the annual payment. Okay, I've got a stewardship on here. We have a, a HLS scheme ending in September 2022. Should we be able to put all the land back into a new countryside stewardship without a break? Um, so 2023, uh, 1st Jan 2023 will be the last year. Um, no, sorry, that's a lie. 2023 is the last year um, you can enter into a stewardship agreement. Um, so potentially you could enter 1st of Jan 2024. Um, so, yeah, potentially. Yeah. yeah, so there'd be a break from that September to the, probably the next January yeah. is when, you, when they all agreements start in January. Mm -hmm. Next one, um, rulings on storing farm, farmyard manure. I'm happy to take that on the basis that really, um, with regard to muck middens and that type of thing, can't imagine they're going to look to put stores for that. Um, 
they will certainly let us know when they do. I think, as everyone knows, um, NVZs are a bit of a dark art. And uh, I think if they had enough troops on the ground, the EA, it could cause a lot of concern. And I think moving forward, it's definitely going to be far more rigorous. Um, it's something to put, we'll probably get away with if we're honest. Um, it might not happen in the future, like Tony says, legislation. I, I just pick up on that. I, I just found some notes I'd made of a, a meeting I had a few weeks ago on ammonia air pollution. And the, the target is to reduce by 16% by 2030. UK ammonia emissions from agriculture are equivalent to um, £8 a tonne per hectare in nitrogen loss to the air. Um, so we've obviously seen the clean air strategy and um, 80%, 87% of UK ammonia emissions come from agriculture. So they are going to be looking seriously at this area. Okay, we've got um, another question. I'd be interested to know your thoughts of the future of British agriculture. Will there still be a place for the small family farm in 20 years time? Or are we heading to a bigger picture and more productive units? I think we'll see a combination of both. I think the small family farm has its place. Now, whether that's as a part-time unit, whether that is as a niche market with diversification, with, you know, producing. The one thing we've seen in the last 12 months is people want provenance and they will pay for provenance. Yes, you know, general um, meat consumption might be going down, but people, when they want a decent roast or steak or whatever are looking at provenance yes the mass produced that you know shop at aldi or wherever um it's it's not the same level but there is a very and particularly where we are with chimney pots in manchester liverpool there are a lot of opportunities for um niche markets and provenance selling having a story to tell and the the restaurants want that story so i uh, know i don't think i don't think far, small farming fam, farms will go i also agree with that because i'll be homeless if uh, if that's the case <laughs> right i think we've had a, a good bunch of questions unless anyone else has got anything else uh, to bring up um i hope everyone found tonight really interesting. It's great to have so many people in. We've got 58 people here, which is fantastic, which is a similar sort of amount that we've had on our, in our seminars. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see you soon. Uh, there's obviously a lot of change around the corner. It's gonna be a decrease in subsidy. There's the opportunity to reap the benefits of this countryside stewardship as funding there for putting tracks in, putting hedging in. Well, I think that's everything we could also dream of, of getting paid to put tracks in, that's fantastic. Um, Elms, who knows what's around the corner. There's the opportunity next year to get a one-off payment. Well, putting that one-off payment into something else, maybe not into farming, maybe into a buy to let or something else. You, you're not beholden to, to put it into the farm. You could invest it somewhere else if you wish. So hopefully you found it useful. Um, like I said, it will be recorded. If you've got any queries following today, um, you, know our, you know us, we're always on the end of the phone and happy to have a chat where we can. Uh, Tony, you got any finding finishing points no just thank you very much i mean without without you we haven't got a business so you know we've got to work to make sure you're sustainable so we can be sustainable we've had to adapt change with things we're doing over um the last 12 months um you know we are looking at ways that we can maintain um what we do and the contact with you the absolute great one that um, our friend Mr Wallace who many of you will know has been with us for 12 months and he's desperate to get in front of you all since he's joined joined us um, we've done a few farm sales we've been doing a number of online farm sales we're finding it's a fantastic way to get rid of perhaps some of the machinery graveyard that sat in the nettles or um, round the corner in the yard um, it's it's amazing what people are buying um, I know I had the experience probably a month ago. I was I stood with a client in the old parlor. They put new um, robots in and the old parlor was there and he was saying, I don't know how to get rid of it. Um, I said, well, you can ch chance it in our online sale and see where you get to. Um, 
he's 10 grand better off today with a parlor that's going to Scotland and he's over the moon. So, you know, there are different opportunities. I never thought we'd be doing online auctions and, you know, stuff would be going all around the countryside and, and people would, would bid on what they bid on. Um, it, it's amazing. Um, so there's always opportunities out there. It's finding them. And, uh, you know, we're here to help you, you know, just pick up the phone. We're still here. We still like talking. We still like meeting you. Thank you very much. Right. I'll bring the meeting to a close. And uh, like I said, you know where we are. Thanks very much for everyone attending.